You know, this is, this is the week where we focus perhaps on giving thanks more than any other time. Perhaps that's because there's a day on your calendar that tells you to do that. You know, sometimes when there's a day on your calendar that tells you to do something, you're a little better at doing it on that particular day than you are on other days. Uh, perhaps there should be a, uh, a, a husband uh, give thanks day or a wife give thanks. Maybe that should be every day uh, on your calendar. You write it in and say, oh, okay, I need to do that today because it says it on my calendar to do it. We have on, this, on our calendar for this week a day in which we give thanks. And hopefully it helps us to reflect upon how blessed we are as individuals. Perhaps that's the reason that one of our favorite songs is the song that says, Count Your Blessings. But you know, sometimes when we give thanks, sometimes when we think about thanksgiving and our blessings, we focus on the physical things that we have. We focus on those physical blessings that the Lord has given to us. But let me ask you something. If something were to transpire in your life today, and you lost every physical possession that you have, would you still be blessed? Would you still have any reason to give thanks? Somebody says, no, not at all. If I lost everything, what in the world? How can I say I'm blessed? You remember what happened to Job in the Old Testament? In Job chapter 1, he lost everything that he had. And you know what he said at the end of that chapter? The Lord gave. What did Job recognize? I didn't earn anything I had. The Lord gave it to me. And the Lord taketh away. You know what the next word is that he says? Cursed be the name of the Lord. That's what he said, right? Right? That's what, it, that's what his wife told him to say. And any man knows if your wife tells you to do something or say something, you, you, you better get on it. Is that what he said? The Lord gave, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When we get to the New Testament, we read about Job. In James chapter 5 and verse 11, James says, You remember the story about Job from the Old Testament? He says, when you read that, God tells us the purpose of that story. And here's the purpose of the story of Job, according to James, James chapter 5 and verse 11. It teaches us that the Lord is very compassionate and He's very generous. What? He took everything that Job had away. He's very compassionate and some translations say very merciful. Job learned that. Have we learned that? Have we learned how blessed we are? This morning I want to invite you to turn to the Psalm 103. And I want us to allow Psalm 103 to teach us this morning how blessed we are. So that we can in turn turn to the Lord and tell Him how thankful we are for all that He has given to us. Here's a psalm. Here's a psalm in verse 2 that tells us, don't forget His benefits. Do we do that sometimes? Here's a psalm that says, forget not all of His benefits. Why would there be a verse in the Bible that tells you not to forget all of God's benefits? Probably because we do. Probably because we need to sing that song, count your many blessings, but not just sing it, we need to make a list of them. And not forget how blessed we are as a people. But notice how David begins this song. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Not some, not just the part that, that, that the Lord gets on Sunday. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Brother and sister in Christ, we need to learn to look at all that the Lord has given to us. We need to look at all of the blessings He has given to us and turn around and bless the Lord for everything that we have. Not just the physical. Forget the physical things. Think about everything else the Lord gives to us. Here is a psalm that has at its very heart not the physical things of life, but the spiritual things of life. 
And here is a psalm that specifically has at its very heart the mercy of God. Look down and we'll come back to those early verses, but look down in verse 8 where it says, The Lord is mercy full. The Lord is mercy full. He's full of mercy and gracious. He's slow to anger. And what does the end of the verse say? He is abounding in mercy. Here's a God who has mercy enough for each and every one of us. Look in verse 11. For as the heavens are high above the earth. How high are the heavens above the earth? Not talking about where the birds fly. Talking about those celestial uh, parts of the universe. How high are they above the earth? As, ha- as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His mercy toward us. How often do we think about how great God's mercy is? Sometimes we have tried to define the difference between grace and mercy. We've talked about grace not just being unmerited favor, but defining grace as receiving that which we don't deserve. And on the other hand, we've tried to define mercy as being, well, perhaps mercy then is not receiving what we do deserve. And those those are good translations. Those are good definitions. Receiving what we don't deserve, not receiving what I do deserve. But that definition sort of makes mercy sound like God's not doing anything. If I'm not receiving what I do deserve, well, that just sort of sounds like, well, God's just not doing anything. He's doing something over here with grace, but when it comes to mercy, he's just not doing something. And that is totally not the definition of mercy. Mercy has nothing to, it is not that God is doing nothing. It is that God is doing everything. The idea of mercy carries with it the idea of pity. That God looks down at his people. And he sees a people in need. And he is a God who has abundance to supply those needs. God feels for us. And so this morning I want us to look at this psalm where the Bible says God feels for us. He is full of mercy, abounding in mercy, more mercy than you can ever imagine in our direction for what he wants to give us. Not physical blessings, he gives us those. We'll look at a couple of those here. But I want you to know how blessed you are this morning. God's mercy does a number of things. We're going to look at them in this psalm. Number one, God's mercy forgives us. I don't know what physical blessings you have, but if you don't have the forgiveness of God, you don't have anything. If you don't have God's forgiveness, it doesn't matter what you have in this life. God's mercy forgives. Look in verse verse, verse 3. Here is a God, don't forget all of His benefits in verse 2, who forgives all of your iniquities. This is an interesting psalm because you have the word iniquities in this psalm, you have the word sins in this psalm, and you have the word transgressions in this psalm. Now all of those are just different ways of saying the same thing, but they each have their own little twist. What does it mean that God forgives me of my iniquities? What are iniquities? Somebody says, well, they're sins. Yep, that's what they are. Well, why don't you just call them sins then? The word iniquity means that you have taken the law of God and you have bent it. You have twisted it. You have distorted it. And by your actions, you have committed iniquity by bending and twisting and distorting the law of God. And what does God's mercy do? He'll forgive you. If you do that to his law. Sins, the word means that we miss the mark. That God tells us what to do and we either come up short or we go wide or we go too long. And God's mercy will forgive you for doing that. Transgressions is a willful rebellion against God. Where I know what God wants me to do and out of spite... I say, I'm not going to do that. And God's mercy will forgive you for even doing that. And notice what this says. It's not just that God's mercy forgives us. One of my favorite passages about forgiveness is right here in this psalm. Look in verse 11. As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy towards those who fear Him. And then verse 12. 
as far as the east is from the west. How far is the east from the west? As far as the east is from the west, so far has the Lord removed our transgressions from us. How far is that? How far is the east from the west? So, suppose, I mean, how far east can somebody go and how far west can somebody go? That's how far God's removed our sins, our transgressions from us. So suppose you, suppose you line up, suppose you line up Superman and Flash, all right? Suppose you line up Superman and Flash, and they're going to go in opposite directions, okay? One of them is going to take my sins with him, and one of them is going to take me with him. And they're going to go in opposite directions as fast as they can go. How far are they going to go? Don't limit yourself to this earth. As far as they can take my sins away from me, and as rapidly as they can do it, is how far God takes my sins away from me. It's not that God hangs my sins over my life. I'm going to give them back to you. If you don't stop what you're doing, David, I'm going to give them back to you. He takes my sins away as far as the east is from the west. And the Bible says, and he never remembers them again. Are you blessed this morning? I'm not talking about your physical blessings. Are you blessed this morning by the mercy of God? Do you have a God who has forgiven you of all of your iniquities and your sins and your transgressions? If you do, we need to say unto God, thank you. Thanksgiving's not about, Thanksgiving's not about pilgrims. I know it is. Thanksgiving's not about turkey. Oops, I know it is. Thanks, what is Thanksgiving about? We think about the national holiday. Guess what we have? We have a spiritual holiday 365 days a year and an extra one on leap year where we say, thank you, God, for your mercy, His mercy that forgives me, His mercy that redeems me. The idea of redemption there, when it's mentioned there in verse 4 where it says He redeems me, redemption has a couple different parts to it. Redemption involves being delivered from, as this verse says, his, He redeems your life from destruction. Redemption has this idea of deliverance. Where you are, you are on a path, you're on a course for destruction, and what does God do? He delivers you from it. He brings you back from it. The, new, the, the, the term has the idea of being bought back. That God paid the price to redeem you, to buy you back out of the consequences for where you were headed. Did God have to do that? Here I am going in a path that is opposite of God. Here I am going in a direction that doesn't want to have anything to do with God. What could God have done? God could have done the same thing some of you have done to your children. All right, if that's what you want, you just keep going. When you hit the wall, you'll come back. God could have just waited. Well, you'll figure it out on your own. God is rich in mercy. And the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He bought us out of our sins. He's the one who paid the ultimate price. And the end of that verse, what does it say? He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Here's the God who gave His own Son. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19 says that God did not redeem us. He, he did not redeem us with gold and silver. He didn't use money to purchase us. But the Bible says in verse 19, He used the precious blood of Jesus. Are you blessed this morning? Has the mercy of God redeemed you? Brother and sister in Christ, if it has, we need to say unto God, thank you, God. Thank you for redeeming me when I wasn't worth it. Thank you for sending your son to die for me and to shed his blood when I deserve something completely different. Thank you, God. 
As I continue in this psalm, His mercy not only forgives me and not only redeems me, but His mercy supplies me with what I need. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, Here is a God who satisfies you with good things. God supplies you with everything that you need. I know you know James chapter 1 and verse 17, where the Bible says, Every good and every perfect gift. I like how that verse has the word every twice. It doesn't just have it once, it has it twice. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from above. Paul would say in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17 that God has given us, think about this, God has given us all things in this life, and here's a word that you might not think is in the Bible, God has given us all things in this life to enjoy. You know, God wants you to enjoy life. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17, God's given you all things to enjoy. Enjoy, obviously, in accordance with the way He has given them to us, and why and how He's given them to us, and the, and the manner in which we are to use them, but He wants us to enjoy life. He supplies us. His mercy not only supplies us and satisfies us with what we need, but it strengthens us. Look at the end of verse 5. When God supplies you, when He satisfies you, He does that so your youth is renewed like the eagles. Does your youth feel renewed? I want you to think about it. Does your youth, your youthfulness, do you wake up every morning and think, Wow, my youth has been renewed overnight. I feel better than I ever had. You ever feel that way? Some of you are shaking your heads no. You know this verse. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. What does that mean? Your strength is going to be made new again. By doing what? Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like, what's in this verse? Eagles. We think physical. We think, oh, my, my, my body is just not what it used to be. Nobody's body is what it used to be. But what about my relationship with God? Where am I in my youthfulness in my relationship with God? Am I being renewed? By Him. When I wait on the Lord, when I, when, when, when I am determined to serve Him, will I run and not be weary? Will I walk and not faint? Yes, if I learn to trust in the Lord with all of my heart. When I learn to lean not on my own understanding. When, when I lean on my own understanding, do I have problems? Do I come up with issues that I can't solve? But when I trust in the Lord with all of my heart, lean, on, lean not on my own understanding, and when all of my ways I acknowledge who? Him, not me. What happens? He'll direct my paths. He'll take care of me. And I will be renewed every day in my strength to serve Him. The devil is trying to beat us down. The devil is trying to sap all of the energy out of us for serving the Lord. Guess what the Lord does? He keeps filling you up. He keeps giving you what you need. How is that? That's His mercy. It's His mercy that not just supplies the physical things of our life. His mercy supplies the spiritual things of our life. Look at verses 6 and 7 where the Bible says His mercy preserves us. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for everybody who's oppressed. Here are God's people who are being oppressed and mistreated. And what does God do? He executes His judgment, His justice, and His righteousness. He takes care of His people. He makes sure that even though they are being oppressed, that they are not forsaken. You know, the Bible says that the Lord will never forsake you. I am with you always, He says. You know, there are times, I guess, in life where things happen and we say, where's God in this? Maybe things happen in your life. 
Maybe things have happened in your family. We look around at things happening in our nation. We say, where's God in this? Well, God's in the same place that He always has been. God has not moved. God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What does the word never mean? It means the same thing it meant when, well, it doesn't mean the same thing it meant when you said it to your kid because you changed your mind. But God doesn't change His mind. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Does God mean what He says? Where's God when all of this happens? He's in the same place He's always been. We need to trust Him. We need to lean upon Him. We need to know that He is the one who preserves us even when others are mistreating us. And then verse 7 says, He made known His ways to Moses, His acts to the children of Israel. What's that talking about? It means that God has not been distant from us. How did God make Himself known to Moses? Burning bush. Did Moses know the presence of God in the burning bush? When Moses said, how am I supposed to go and speak? They won't listen to me. What happened? Throw your staff on the ground. What did it turn into? Serpent. Who made it do that? God did. What's, all, of, all, of these, all of these miracles, when, they crossed, when the Israelites crossed the Red, the Red Sea on dry ground, what was that evidence of? God. All along there, what is this verse saying? God is saying, I am with you, I am with you, I will take care of you. We need to look at God's mercy. And we need to see His mercy preserving us, taking care of us, and always with us. And then we see that God's mercy, what does it do? It waits. It's one of my favorite things about the mercy of God. Is that God's mercy waits. What does that mean? Look at verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. Do you like that? How quick do you, got, how quick do you want God to be to anger when we mess up? Would you like God to be as quick to anger as you are to anger sometimes? Oh, no, no, sir, no, sir. I want God to be a lot slower than that. The Bible says God is slow to to anger. What does that mean? When there is a punishment to be delivered because of sin and transgression to His law, God holds that punishment back as long as is possible. Aren't you thankful for that? Over in Psalm 78, I like this verse. Psalm 78 verse 38 says, But God, being full of compassion forgave their iniquity. Talk about the Israelites. And this psalm is a great history of Israel. Talk about how they rebelled and rebelled and rebelled against God. It says, God forgave their iniquity. He did not destroy them. And then this part of Psalm 78, 38. Yes, many a time God turned His anger away and did not stir up all of His wrath. You go back and study the history of Israel. Do you see that to be true? Many times God turned back His anger. The mercy of God looks at a punishment that we deserve and He holds it back as long as He can. We know the verse in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 where the Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. Aren't you thankful that you have a God whose mercy waits on that punishment? And then you keep going. Look down to verse 10. Psalm 103 and verse 10, where it says, He has not, aren't you glad about this? He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. He doesn't always punish us the way that we deserve to be punished. If you go back and look in uh, Ezra chapter 9, you'll see in Ezra chapter 9 a passage where, where Ezra says to God, Lord, our sins have risen above our heads. He says that in about verse 6 of Ezra 9. He says, our sins are so high, they're just above our heads. You ever feel that way? God, my sins are so far, I am just buried in my sins. But it's in this passage where Ezra says that, God, you have not punished us like we should have been punished. You have punished us less than our iniquities deserve. That's the mercy of God. That's the mercy of God that waits 
And then finally, look in verse 9, where he says, He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. What does that mean? That means that while he holds it back as long as he possibly can. While God's punishment, he holds what we deserve back. Verse 9 says, ultimately, it's got to come. His punishment will come. What side of that do I want to be on? God is waiting and waiting and waiting for you to give your life to Him. He's waiting. He's waiting and waiting and waiting to send Jesus back. Why? So that you'll decide to obey Him. So that He won't have to punish you. That's God's mercy. That's God's mercy that is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, and He's waiting and He's waiting, but the Bible says the day is going to come when His waiting stops. Thank God that He's a merciful God. Let me briefly look at these next couple. God's mercy sympathizes with us. Look in verse 13, where God sympathizes with us as a father does. As a father pities his children, verse 13, so the Lord pities those who fear him. God, doesn't, God treats us like his children. He behaves, he, he takes upon the role of him as a father, knowing what we need, caring for us, and sympathizes with us as a father does with his own children. Then look at verse 14. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. He remembers we're just human. He remembers that, 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 we, that we are not perfect. And in that, He sympathizes with us as our Creator that says, I know they're not God. I know they're not perfect. I know they're going to make mistakes. And He pities us, sympathizes with us in that. You know, sometimes parents have a hard time remembering that their children are not adults. That their children, when they, when they are children, let's put it that way, that when their children are children, that when their children are children, they are children. And sometimes they get angry with their children because they're not acting like adults. Well... When somebody becomes an adult, what do they need to act like? They need to act like an adult. We've taken the noun adult and we've made a verb out of it. Have you known that? Well, I don't feel like adulting today. You know, we've taken a noun and we made a verb out of it. Well, are you going to adult today? I don't know if I'm going to adult today or not. When I'm an adult, I need to act like an adult. Sometimes as parents, we need to remember that our kids, when they're kids, they're going to act like kids. God knows that about us. Our kids, when they're kids, they're going to make mistakes. God looks at us as our Father, as our Creator, and He says, you know, I know they're going to make mistakes. Does His mercy just say, that's okay? No, it doesn't say that. Does His mercy say, no big deal, you know, they can do whatever they want? No, it doesn't say that. But His mercy waits, and His mercy sympathizes. And His mercy sympathizes with us so much that He sent Jesus to be our Savior. The Bible says that Jesus became, he, Jesus came to this earth. He took on the form of a human body, a human life, in order that He might sympathize with us in this life. And that's what we're reading here when we read verse 16, where it talks about the, that the time comes where our place on this earth is remembered no more. The time comes where we're not going to be on this earth anymore. But we've got a Savior who's paid the price for us. He's lived a life on this earth. And through that life, He knows what it's like to be human. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to have others to try to get us to go against the will of God. And the mercy of God looks down at His children and sympathizes. Aren't you glad? We have a week that we think about giving thanks to God. How about every day we think about how much we have been blessed by God by His mercy that forgives us, that redeems us, that waits, His mercy that sympathizes, 
His mercy that rules. We, we're not going to take time to develop this. But as, as you look at this passage and look down at verse 19 where it says, The Lord has established His throne in heaven and His kingdom rules over all. God's mercy rules. God is in control. God is in charge of this world. He doesn't just sit on His throne in order to issue dictates and punishments. He sits on His throne to be a merciful God to us. Hebrews 4 and verse 16 calls His throne the throne of grace. God rules. But here's the last thing I want us to see in Psalm 103. Is that God's mercy differentiates. What does that mean? Here's a psalm that says, The mercy of God is full. It is abounding. It is as far as the heavens are from the earth. That's how much mercy God has for us. And His mercy forgives us. His mercy redeems us and supplies us. It preserves us. It waits for us. It sympathizes with us. But God wants us to know His mercy differentiates. In other words, His mercy is not extended to everyone equally. Look in verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him. God's mercy is only available to those who fear God. To those who stand in awe of God. To those who hold God in reverence. Those are the only ones that His mercy is extended to. But that's not all that He says. Verse 18. His mercy is from everlasting to everlasting on those, verse 18, who keep His covenant. Not just a matter. If you stand in awe of God, if you, if you stand in reverence to God, what are you going to do? You're going to want to keep His covenant. But that's not all that He says. Look at the end of verse 18. And to those who remember His commandments to do them. God differentiates. His mercy is only extended to those who fear Him, to those who keep His covenant, to those who do His commandments. Are you a recipient this morning of God's mercy? Are you a recipient this morning of God's forgiveness? Of God's redemption? Are you a recipient this morning of the abundant grace that God has? He's just ready to give if you're not one who fears God, if you're not one who keeps His covenant, if you're not one who does what He says, then His mercy has not been extended to you. And the day will come when God's mercy stops waiting, when God's mercy stops holding back the punishment. And the day will come when justice must prevail. Have you taken the steps necessary to be obedient to the will of God? As a Christian, you will have blessings. The song says, count your blessings. Beautiful thing is, as Christians, you can't count them all. You can't count them all because you can't see them all. You don't even know them all. You don't know everything that the mercy of God does for you on a daily basis. You just know that He's doing it. Because as a child of God, you will be blessed above every person on this earth. The question is, are you a child of God? Are you a recipient of His abundant mercy? Have you in your heart heard what Jesus has done in dying for your sin to being raised from the dead on the third day? And are you ready to believe that this morning? To believe with all of your heart that Jesus is the Son of God. The evidence for that is overwhelming. Do you believe it?
If you have a heart that's full of faith in what Jesus has done for you, then ha- do you have a heart that is ready to say, I want to stop serving self and serving sin and serving Satan, and I want to start serving God. I'm ready today to make up my mind to stop doing wrong and start doing what's right. That's what the Bible calls repentance. And God's mercy pleads for you to do that today. He's not willing that any should perish. But He wants all of us to come to repentance. Are you ready to do that today? To receive His mercy? To confess the faith that is in your heart just as they did in Bible times and to be baptized just as they were in the New Testament. To be baptized for the remission of every one of your sins. To allow God's mercy to overflow upon you in forgiving your iniquities, forgiving your sins, forgiving your transgressions, and taking them as far away from you as the east is from the west, and never, ever remembering them against you again. If you want that today, you can be baptized and allow the blood of Jesus in that baptist, in, in baptism to wash away every sin you've ever committed. And the Bible says to be raised to walk in newness of life, giving your life to Him, serving Him faithfully so that the blood of Jesus can continue to cleanse you from every sin. We have, as Christians, a reason to give thanks. We have tons of reasons. The question this morning is, are you a faithful Christian? If we can help you to become a recipient of the mercy of God today, Why don't you come right now as together we stand and sing.